Well, um, <clears throat> I want to thank the Institute for uh, you know, giving me this little platform. I can barely say the name Kolchiski, my name, in 10 minutes, but I'll try and squeeze in <laughs> as much as I can. I want to thank my fellow panelists, and uh, thank you all for coming out on a very cold night. It's, you know, kind of, I've often seen this room packed on bitter, bitter cold nights, and it always reminds me that Manitobans are a, are a hearty and, you know, group of people who you know, are determined to come out. Um, I also have to say, I'm the designated mean person on this panel. There's always someone who's not going to paint a pretty picture. I'm the guy who's not going to paint the pretty picture. I teach in Native Studies, and I've worked with hydro-affected communities in northern Manitoba, and there are no pretty pictures I have to show you. I can show you pictures of mice droppings in classrooms in hydro-affected communities. I can show you pictures of people who have lost their way because the ancient way of life that they practiced in modern forms has basically been destroyed within a generation. I can show you pictures of promises, solemn promises that were made in our generation that have been broken, and I can show you pictures of agreements that don't meet the standard, even in Canada, of the kinds of agreements that we should be signing and the detrimental effects of those things. So very briefly, I'll say a little bit about history, um, a little bit about, uh, uh, I guess, where we are now, and uh, maybe a little bit about uh, some of the things that I've seen, I suppose. In terms of history, um, you know, uh, uh, virtually all of the hydroelectric production, which is responsible for, you know, the vast majority of electricity in this province, as has been said, uh, comes on rivers that were used by Aboriginal people. From the first dams on the Winnipeg River that affected, for example, the community of Sagin, through to the dam built on Grand Rapids, through to the mega Churchill River diversion and Lake Winnipeg, you know, dredging project. Uh, all of these affected Aboriginal communities. The community of Chimewewin was relocated, the community of South Indian Lake was flooded and you know, partially relocated. All the communities lost access to fishing territories. You know, you talk to people who were born about the same time that I was born, I'm not going to tell you when. Um, you know, they would go out with their parents on the Nelson River and uh, their mothers would give them cups. Take a cup with you in case you get thirsty. Nowadays you travel on the Nelson River, you travel with bottled water. Back in the day, I travel on the Mackenzie River with hunters and trappers. You travel on a river, you're going on a long trip, you stop, you have a bathroom break, you have a cigarette break, you light a fire, you cook some fish. You travel on the Nelson River today, you can't get to shore. There's so much debris, trees, the, the raising and lowering of the water level in this clean green energy that we produce is constantly sending trees into the river, which means that you have to, if you're lucky, you find a place where you stop a boat, you get off the boat, you kind of balance yourself on some trees to get to shore to be able to go to the bathroom if you want to, and you're not going to drink the water. Every time anyone from Hydro comes to Pemichicum at Cross Lake Manitoba, they put bottled water from the Nelson River or water from the Nelson River on the table. People from Hydro who keep assuring the communities the water is completely safe will not drink it themselves. You know, the leadership of Nisichwasik that signed a partnership agreement that says the water is safe, you, uh, they bring in, you know, truckloads of bottled water every week to, so that they've got water in their band offices. Nobody's drinking that. What used to be the water of a river that you could see to the bottom, you know, is now the river is silted, largely destroyed for local use, dangerous because of the way the, the, the water level changes for people. So um, when the Churchill River uh, and Lake Winnipeg uh, 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 projects were developed, the communities were at first against them in the 1970s. Eventually, they had no choice but to sign an agreement, so they signed the Northern Flood Agreement. And the Northern Flood Agreement made some very broad promises to people, including a schedule as attached to the agreement that says research would be done uh, to work towards the eradication of mass poverty and unemployment. That's a direct quote, the eradication of mass poverty and unemployment. It wasn't a substantive promise to do that, but it was to engage in studies that would lead to that. And the, the agreement, the Northern Flood Agreement, generally made some very vague but strong promises saying that the communities would ultimately benefit from hydroelectric production, from the dams that were being built, from the diversions that were happening. Um, in fact, the communities didn't benefit from it. In fact, the Northern Flood Agreement, almost after the moment it was signed, was largely ignored by the utility and by the province. And so the, the broader agreements, the broader commitments that were made weren't respected. An arbitrator wasn't assigned so that uh, the communities had no recourse, no ability to go forward and press their concerns. And after 10 years of seeing their rivers destroyed and virtually nothing come back, come back to them, communities, some of them, were persuaded to sign implementation agreements to, to take a few million dollars 
you know, sometimes substantial chunks of money, 20 million or 30 million or 40 million dollars, um, uh, and sign off on all of their commitments made through the Northern Flood Agreement. Uh, four of the five community signatories over the course of the 1990s signed implementation agreements, and those paved the way for the next round of hydroelectric development and the new form of agreements we have in Manitoba called partnership agreements. The, so the, the two latest dams being built, the Wasquatam Dam and the Kiosk Dam, I've worked with you know dissidents, I suppose, in both communities who aren't happy with the agreements we're getting. And basically, um, I mean, in 10 minutes, like I said, I can hardly say my name. But uh, one of the things I want to tell you, the partnership agreements, both for the Wasquatam project and the Kiosk project, involve the communities taking money they got, which they desperately need, and I can't emphasize that enough, conditions in these communities are very, very bad. Housing is at a crisis level in all of the communities. You know, E. coli gets found in the water. Their water or sewage treatment systems often are outdated. You know, there are horror stories about uh, what life is like uh, in parts of Spit Lake and parts of Fox Lake and, and the, you know, a part of Nelson House that's called the Bronx. Um, so, uh, the partnership agreement takes the money that they got to compensate them for the damage that was done in the past. They invest that, so they don't use it to buy more houses and to improve the schools and to improve the conditions. They're supposed to invest it in the next hydro dam, which will further destroy the river, in the hope that they will get profits. So far, what Nisichawasik Nelson House got out of the partnership agreement it signed, uh, you know, in the, the mid-2000s, around 2005, um, is they've gotten about $134 million in debt. As the cost of the dam, as could have been predicted, was twice as high as anticipated, and as the sales to the United States were substantially weaker after the, the economic crisis and through the, the production of more natural gas through fracking in the United States. So you have a community that's basically put its future into the hands of Manitoba Hydro and now will not see significant returns, at least now they're saying till about 2034, if uh, economic conditions improve and if uh, you know, substantial profits eventually start to be made, which are fairly big ifs. That, that's the same model being used with the Kiosk Dam partnership agreement and we can anticipate that that dam will also cost a lot more than is being estimated. We have some serious doubts about whether that energy uh, can be sold. Um, at the same time uh, as this is happening in Quebec, the Quebec government signs with the Northern Quebec Cree an agreement called the Peace of the Braves. And the Peace of the Braves basically says, regardless of whether the dams are even built, regardless of whether they make a profit, in order to allow them to go ahead and not go ahead with any legal challenges, the, the, the James Bay and Northern Quebec Cree would be getting um, uh, I think it's $70 million a year over a period of 50 years, which adds up to $3.5 billion. And after the 50 years, it's not that then they're done. The agreement reopens with the assumption that probably the values will be higher and they'll renegotiate uh, a renewed agreement at roughly the same level. Um, I was actually, ironically, when the Peace of the Braves was signed, I was one of the few people nationally who could be found to criticize that agreement because I said it wasn't enough. And it's ironic because here in Manitoba, I'm having to tell everybody about the Peace of the Braves as if it's this great thing, simply because it's far better than the partnership agreements that we're signing. Uh, it's my view that actually our activity in northern Manitoba is nothing short of criminal. Manitoba was founded to a certain extent on a colonialism, and we all like to say, well, that's something that our ancestors did. Well, it wasn't even our ancestors. I wasn't there when it happened. My grandparents weren't even there when it happened. They came later. You know, so there's no such, you know, that's too bad that colonialism happened in the past, but it's over and done with. In fact, our generation right now is engaged in some of the mo you know, most devastating colonial activities that uh, are a part of the sad history of this province. When you look at Aboriginal poverty, when you look at what's going on in communities in northern Manitoba, don't say, oh, it's natural. Don't say all those communities are like that. Oh, it's just something that's inevitable. It's inherent for Aboriginal people, which is the kind of thing that assumption that people sometimes have. It's a creation of social conditions. What we have in Manitoba is a racial reconfiguration and redistribution of wealth. We are taking away the wealth that people had in being able to drink the water of the river and being able to have you know, communities that had a link to their culture through their traditional economic activities. Uh, and we're taking away, we're turning that into 
commodities and capital and all of the profits, all of the wealth is being transferred to the south and all of the costs are being borne in the north. It's not only economically inefficient because we'll be having to try and pay the social costs of that for generations and generations. It's about as deeply unethical, as deeply unjust as you can get. And it's my belief that the highest calling of human beings as human beings is the calling for justice. And in Manitoba, we are nowhere close to achieving that aspiration.